In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to the talk on Mary the Immaculate Conception. When we talk about the dogma of the Immaculate Conception that was proclaimed by Pope Pius IX in, 15, in 1854, the dogma concerns the conception of Mary in the womb of her mother Anne, not the conception of Jesus in the womb of Mary. Of course, the conception of Jesus in the womb of Mary is Immaculate Conception, and does not need a dogma. The dogma is concerns the fact that even though Joachim and Anne, the father and mother of Mary, had a regular sexual relationship, from the very first moment of her conception in the womb of her mother Anne, Mary was prevented by a special grace of God to be immune from the stain of original sin. Later on, when Mary was able to exercise her freedom, she continued to choose a life without sin freely and willingly. The whole life of Mary is sinless, and that is what the dogma of the Immaculate Conception is all about. Allow me before I go on to the scriptural basis of the Immaculate Conception to talk a little bit about original sin. All of us know from the book of Genesis that when God created man and woman, he gave them freedom. That freedom is authentic. However, that freedom is also limited. God commanded Adam and Eve not to eat, to eat from all the fruits of the garden except the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Allowing them to eat from the fruits of all the garden, Pope John Paul II commands, means a wide range of freedom, true freedom, authentic freedom. Yet it is a limited freedom because from the knowledge of good and evil, uh, from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they should not uh, eat from that fruit. So, therefore, the fact that Adam and Eve decided to go against the commandment of God created in them what we call today original sin. St. Paul said, by the sin of the first parents, Sin entered our human history. Man and woman, Adam and Eve, our first parents, allowed sin to start exist in our human nature for the first time ever. Mysteriously, the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches, mysteriously, that original sin is transferred to all of us. That original sin is like you put a mud in a fountain and then the mud goes through the entire river. The whole human nature began to be stained by original sin because of the sin of Adam and Eve. In a way, we don't understand why, but the only thing we understand is the Catechism also teaches, it's like the whole human race is like one body or one family and the stain of original sin reached every one of us. Now, remember, the incarnation, the fact that God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, became man, took on a human nature. The reason God chose this way to human race, to, to save the human race, is because by taking on that human nature, he wanted to recreate it, recreate human nature. There is an incredible parallel between the book of Genesis and the Gospel of John. The book of Genesis, Adam and Eve, man and woman, entered, allowed sin 
to enter human nature in the Gospel of John. The new man, remember Pontius Pilatus called Jesus man. And the new woman, remember the uh, wedding of Cana and Galilee called Mary the woman. The new man and the new woman of the Gospel of John are supposed to recreate the human nature without stain of sin. Therefore, the new Adam, Jesus Christ, by taking on a, hu a human nature, of course, he took on a human nature that it doesn't have any stain of sin. Plus, the subject, the subject who is acting in this nature is divine in Jesus Christ. Jesus cannot sin even if he tries. God cannot commit an act against himself. It's impossible. Mary, on the other hand, was a creature. She was a creature endowed with true freedom. At the same time, God gave her the grace <clears throat> not to sin. On the one hand, we see God intervening and give her, giving her the special grace not to sin. On the other hand, Mary did have authentic freedom and had to cooperate with the grace of God not to sin. It's a kind of a paradoxical thing. On the one hand, it looks like God is doing everything. On the other hand, Mary looks like she's doing everything. But both of them are cooperating. This is the story of all of us anyway. God's grace is always available. We need to answer it. Where does the idea of the Immaculate Conception come from? One time in the New Testament, in the whole Bible, one time there is a word <coughs> used in the Gospel of Luke. When the angel came to Mary, he said to her, Hail, full of grace. The word full of grace in Greek is kecharitomene. One time in scripture that word is used never again on any other person except one time in the Virgin Mary. The word kecharitomene does not mean favorite one. That is a very bad translation. Those who are translating scripture <coughs> and using Favorite one is not a good translation because the word charis means grace, means divine light. Kecharitomene actually does not only mean full of grace. That word in Greek we cannot translate in English in adequate way. The word kecharitomene means, if I may, <coughs> if I may um, translate it word for word, it means, hail you who have always been full of grace, who is now full of grace and will always be full of grace. Kecharitomene excludes any time that Mary was not full of grace. It means that in every single moment of her existence, from the moment of her conception until her assumption into heaven, Mary has been full of grace. That is the meaning of the word kecharitomen. Notice that when the angel came to announce the incarnation to Mary, he didn't say, hail Mary full of grace. He said, hail full of grace. He skipped her name. Her name comes later in a later verse. Why did the angel skip the name of Mary? As you know, in the Old Testament, as well as in the New Testament, changing the name of a person who is invited to perform a special service or mission uh, towards to God, that the change of name indicates a new identity, a new mission. The fact that the angel called her hail full of grace, the word full of grace became Mary's name, became Mary's identity, became Mary's mission, became Mary's whole being, everything about her is full of grace. Why did God want Mary to be full of grace? First reason, it is impossible that the one who is going to generate God according to the flesh, to have herself 
sin in her body. Remember, Mary generated God according to the laws of gestation, like any other woman. Jesus didn't just come like a light going through the window in the womb of the Virgin Mary. No, Jesus was formed in the womb of the Virgin Mary exactly like any other child. She, conce she conceived him and she, he grew in her and she delivered him according to the natural laws of gestation. And therefore, it is impossible that her body could be a sinful body receiving the original sin. But even more importantly than that is the fact that Mary and Jesus are recapitulating in their human nature the, the old human nature. They are recreating human nature. Adam and Eve introduced sin. Mary and Jesus will abolish sin in their human nature. Mary, because of that absence of sin in her life, and because she decided to um, live her whole life without sin, of course, at the end of her life, in the next talk, we'll talk about her assumption. But that absence of sin in her life, in her nature, is an icon of the church. What are we doing here as a church on the earth? Every single person, all of us in the church, we are praying, we are celebrating the sacraments, we are receiving communion, we are, rece we, we are going to confession, etc. All that we do, we do it for one purpose, to be united to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at the end of our lives. Well, that union, that, during that union, death will be abolished. Our nature will be recreated. That has already taken place in Mary because from the moment of her conception, Mary was immune <coughs> from the stain of original sin. That's why the Second Vatican Council uh, called her pre-redeemed. In what sense is she pre-redeemed? All of us know that the teaching of the Magisterium, tradition, scripture, the salvation of Christ is universal. Every single person must be redeemed by Christ, including the Virgin Mary. No human being can be redeemed without Christ, and the Christ universal, the, the salvation of Christ is universal, encompasses every human person from the beginning of time until the end of time. Well, if Mary was conceived without sin, how is she redeemed by Christ? The Second Vatican Council calls her redeemed in an excellent manner. The fact that she was born without original sin, she is pre-redeemed. In Mary, the salvation of Christ was applied to her in an excellent manner, in a different manner than every single human being. Today, <clears throat> what is our life? What is our journey all about? Our journey is to imitate someone, a human being. Her name is Mary. Again, Jesus Christ cannot sin. Our whole journey is to try as much as we can to be Keharito men. When God created us, He intended us to be Keharito men, full of grace. He intended us to have a being united to Him on the level of the maximum holiness that we can have. Unfortunately, we messed up. Unfortunately, we have a journey, but that journey can be helped with the prayers, mediation of the sinless one, the Virgin Mary. Every single time you are tempted to sin, always ask for the help and the intercession of the Virgin Mary. Walk with her. One last point. The Virgin Mary will always answer because she is a mother. Her immaculate conception is, and can, is related and cannot be separated from her motherhood. Her whole identity 
as a mental conception is also an identity of a mother. In your journey, as you're struggling with sin, always throw yourself in the hands of the Blessed Mother. Saints in the history of the church have always invoked the Virgin Mary on their journey. May God bless you.